I was in Amsterdam for Money 2020. It's a fantastic city and a fantastic event. Three days packed with catching up with old friends, meeting new interesting people, doing new and interesting things. But the thing I love the most about this event is the opportunity that the team at Money 2020 present to creators like myself to record this podcast on the showroom floor. Early on the first morning, I sat down and spoke to James Hill, CEO of Flexus, about using real-time data for collections. And this is what he had to say. James Hill, CEO of Flexus, the leading digital-first debt management, collection, and recovery platform. Welcome to How to Lend Money to Strangers with myself, Brendan LaGrange, here today in Amsterdam. Great. Thank you very much, Brendan. James, you were working in the training, vocational education field. Your background is in law. I see you are a member of the delightfully named Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn. But now you're a fintech CEO. So what was it that you saw in Flexus that made you take that pivot? Yeah, so it's um, really interesting. Yeah, I guess leaving university, going into law, qualifying as a barrister, moving into ed tech and then to fintech. Um, bit of a bit of a leap um i think for me was that i've always been in and around software um and whether it be different types of of markets different types of you know legacy and and, and modern and i think the thing with flexus was that you know effectively it operates in a market that's full of legacy software and organizations really that fuel their solution to the problem with people um, and it just seemed like a, a fantastic opportunity uh, in a great market Cool, and we'll talk a lot about what you're doing there in a minute. But first, let's set the scene a bit, because I know you've got your own podcast, which is a video podcast, very fancy. But for my audience, it's primarily, primarily audio-based. And so they won't be able to see you. But you know, working in debt collection, they'll have a good image in their mind. So a six foot three, full of tattoos, shaved head, big baseball bat, scary looking grin. But no, obviously, none of that is true. I think in reality, probably we never really had a true situation of that kind of movie-themed debt collector. But actually, a friend of mine did employ someone like that once to recover a stolen quad bike. But largely speaking, that's an exaggeration. But the fact is, the debt collecting field has changed, both in reputation, but also in reality. We are experiencing a sort of a more enlightened approach to recovering debt and working with consumers and customers of ours that are in financial trouble. So set the scene for us a bit. What does a good modern debt collection operation look like? What are they focusing on? What are they thinking about? How do they go about their day-to-day -day business? Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. I mean, we have this conversation a lot, whether we talk to you know, investors or if I talk to people in my family about what we do, and, and you get the same thing, right? Oh, so you're a debt collector. No, 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 we're not. You know, we don't collect the debt. We're not an outsourced service provider. You know, we provide our clients with a market-leading white box software solution. Um, and so I think the biggest shift really is that everything in financial services is and needs to become incredibly consumer-led, customer-led. And I think that you see things now with, with, from a regulation perspective with things like consumer duty, but actually just from a customer perspective, if you look at the sexy end of originations, which everyone loves, um, you know, that market is all driven by how quick a form is to complete, how quickly you can disperse a loan, you know, how the NPS score, how many collections teams really look at NPS, you know, very, very few. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, you need software that enables clients to reach their customers in a way that allows them to engage when they want, how they want. Um, and at any point. Um, and that's really what we do. Um, and so the way we always pitch it to people is that, you know, our software helps our clients, you know, collect outstanding debt quicker while still being able to have that sensitive and tailored approach to a very, very difficult situation. Um, and fundamentally, you know, we talk about it as sort of collecting more. Um, but the reality is that of every financial services product, you know, 10% of those customers will end up in arrears. You know, and when you think of the cost to acquire a customer, um, if you're then going to, you know, lose that customer, 
um, suddenly, you know, your business model doesn't make sense. Yeah, and you spoke about, you know, starting with originations and, you know, my background's in data science and we would build scorecards in originations and they would have maybe sort of six month lifespan before we handed over to behavior score and we'd manage a customer until they missed a payment and then it was collections job to do something with it. We kind of forgot all about them and all the data work we had done, all the insights we'd got were largely seen as unnecessary or irrelevant. Certainly by the time they'd missed their second or third payment, they were just bad by any score measure and we stopped looking. But we, you know, this is 20 years later now, we have a lot more data on our hands and a lot more people in organizations using data. So what does that look like in terms of what you're working with, what you have access to, and what you uh, can give to your customers or your clients through your tools? Yes, I think it's, it's a really interesting thing around how much work, investment, and effort goes into the originations process and then how collections is seen as, well, it's the bit we have to do. You know, we're going we're gonna to drive it through people. We're going to do, do that side of it. It's all legal letters. Um, and actually, I think if you're a CFO in a business, you know, lending money is, is like you say, is the easy, easiest thing in the world. Um, but if you're going to transform your business, you need to transform the entire customer journey. And when you look at the data that's available, you know, we had a conversation off air about open banking, but you know, open banking in terms of account information still carries this idea that there's no value exchange in collections because why would someone allow you access to their bank account when they're in financial difficulties? But the reality from our perspective is that if you are providing a customer with a real-time solution to their problem, you need the most information that's available at that point to give them the best possible outcome. And we see, you know, from our software, we can see that customers are accessing typically, you know, we get a huge amount of traffic on Sunday nights. You know, you get a huge amount of traffic on um, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Day. You know, it's when, if you think about it, when you think about challenges and problems you've got in your life, the times you think about it is when you're sitting in bed at night, yeah. just before you go to sleep, right? And so if a customer wants to ring X bank, I'm not going to name anyone, you know, if the answer is you need to ring us between 9.30 and 4.30, if I work in a supermarket, I'm not going to be able to call you ever. You know, I can't have my phone. Um, why can't I deal with it? And why can't you actually empower me as your customer to resolve that problem? Yeah, and I think the just fundamental thing is like this is a conversation none of us want to have. And if there's any excuse not to have it, we won't have it. So if when we pluck up the courage to actually phone, because it's got to the point, it's dire, we understand we need to fix this, we phone up and the team's not available, or 30 minutes waiting on a phone line, or when I get through, they're asking for all sorts of bits of paper that I don't have to hand. I'm going to give up and I'm going to wait until I have no excuse but to sort this out, by which point nothing can be done. There's, yeah, it's months later and any chance of recovery is gone. What I like to think has happened as a sort of silver lining with COVID is we realized because... I mean, it's maybe a slightly cynical approach, but lots of good customers went into collections too. Lots of customers that typically wouldn't have been in that area with products that were deemed very safe. Their industries got shut down. Suddenly they needed help. And maybe we started to quickly get rid of some of this sort of antagonistic view of people in collections and see actually this is just people struggling day to day. And we popularized tools like payment holidays and and restructures that can be helpful to everybody but also that it's comfort that comes from electronic uh, interaction i mean normally we're talking about how you know using the phones is destroying the youth and all this stuff because we don't have human conversations but the fact is when it comes to an awkward conversation you would much rather i would think a lot of people would much rather do it with that barrier and that ability to sit on a tool and let the computer do some work with me and not have to have that awkward sort of parent teacher sort of authority figure overlooking you and saying, hey, you were naughty and you, you spent more than you had. So I actually think this is one of the best use cases for, for open banking. But my guess is that people are worried that if I open my bank account to you, you're going to take the money from me. And that is a mindset change. There's a branding the industry needs to think about why 
that probably still exists. I believe it's not yeah, the case anymore, but there's a long legacy of sort of fairly aggressive collections. But getting people to understand this is not about stealing, you know, taking what's ours from your bank account. And if we can clear that, I think it is like a phenomenal tool for the space to be able to actually help the person, not just saying you owe me 200 pounds, pay it by next week, but saying I can actually now help you restructure this, think through the whole big picture. Um, you know, the days 20 years ago in another country, so we're not naming names or getting anyone in trouble, but you know, we would definitely try and get any money from the customer that you know, if they didn't pay another bank, that was fine by us. We would just want all the money that was owed to us. You know, I think with regulation and with enlightenment to some extent, that's not the case in the world. How does a good, what, what does a good open banking use case in collections look like? Again, you don't need to name names, but if, you, if there is somebody who's doing it really well, but by all means, give them the credit. But just what does that look like for a collections team that understands the value and, and leverages the value of open banking? Yeah, so I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, if you take it back to the, the first thing you said around the difficulty around the circumstances of being in debt and actually reaching out and engaging with somebody, the reality is that, you know, debt is a mountain that only gets bigger. And, you know, individual household levels of debt are in the, you know, thousands or billions, right? It's, you know, the, the numbers are astronomical. The hardest thing really is that engagement thing. I think there is still a huge stigma around the idea of debt and that debt is I'm in trouble with someone. Um, and so I think that actually the industry and, and the regulator, you know, with consumer duty is, is trying to push this. But I think the industry have a lot to do because we, we were saying before, if you spread out a thousand bits of paper on the floor right now, I guarantee you every single person in here would be able to identify which one was a debt letter. They all look the same. Yeah. I think the, the, the point around open banking is interesting is that actually, particularly in the UK, if you look at financial literacy levels, the, the average age of financial literacy is, is, is school age, right? It's primary school age, really. And so if you say to someone, what's a nausea? What's a snozzia? You know, what does, you know, if you take an Amex card, um, you know, today, and it says, this is the interest on your Amex card, this is your balance, this is your limit. Okay, how much is that actually going to cost you over the next 40 years, right? No one will be able to work it out. Yeah. Right? Maybe someone with a maths PhD would work it out, right? But the thing is, is that people don't. And there's a, there's a generational attitude to debt and borrowing that's completely different. So I look at my parents' view of debt, and then I think of, you know, people who are under the age of 30. And, and a lot of people will say, well, a student loan's not debt, right? Buy now, pay later, it's not debt, right? You know, and they have a completely different categorization. And I think it's the categorization which is where open banking really comes in. The... The thing that always makes me laugh a little bit is that every single bank and financial services organization, when they go to tender, always has a question of, um, what do you do with AI? Standard, you know, question one. Um, question two, you know, what, what's your open banking integrations? And actually, the thing that always makes me laugh with that is you go, well, do you mean PISP or AISP? No, 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 just open banking. Oh, okay, just open banking, right? Oh, it's a, it's a new thing. Um, and I think when you look at it, so, so payments-wise, so, so we integrate with, with Acquired for um, open banking payments. And the thing for me is it's all about how you can remove or reduce friction in a process. So it doesn't matter what you do, if you create technology and sell technology products, you want to ultimately help people to be more efficient and streamline a process, right? So if someone gets to the point where they're making a payment, they're walking down the street, they've got a car finance they can't pay because they've just lost their job, um, but they're going to give you something. If the last part of that journey is, okay, now get your wallet out, get your bank card, type in your card details and make a payment, I don't carry a wallet. Okay, if I can't use Apple Pay, you've yeah, lost me at this point, point now. Um, and so that's where the open banking from a payments perspective is great because, again, it's just taking that step out where if you've got a customer to the point where they've engaged and they've bought in and they're on that journey to resolving um, their debt episode, you shouldn't put any more barriers in the way, right? And I think that when it comes to account information, it's also really interesting because if you take someone who works in a contact center who might be on, you know, low, low wage, right, who is equally as, as vulnerable to cost of living crisis as the customer they're talking to, 
when the customer rings in and says, I can't afford to pay this, the conversation ultimately is a conversation between two people. And they're going to be asking them, well, tell me how much do you spend on this? You know, what's your priority debt? What's a non-priority debt? No one uses those words, yeah. right? What's your income and expenditure? No one uses those words, right? You know, how much do you get paid? How much do you spend? Oh, okay, I understand what that means. And I think that's where the, the open banking from the account information side is really useful because that suddenly allows you to build a picture of the customer's circumstances and actually work out really fast how you can give them something that will benefit them. Um, you know, we, so we use Money Hub for AISP integration, um, and I still think it's, it's a very slow burn in collections because it's, it's absolutely mainstream in originations. Um, but I think that when you're looking at real-time software with real-time outcomes, it's the account information really that will drive that as fast as possible. Yeah, and I think it's changing that sort of feeling from it being a test of knowing the things about your own spending to a review of the situation. And it's also just changing where collections fits within that organization. We, we used to do a sales training course for our collections agents, but it's about more than just the, the telephone skills. It's about acknowledging that this is the hardest sell you can make, is like getting people to pay you back for something they already have. You know, you're not even got a product at the other end. It's about thinking how do we remove friction in processes and things like that because people don't want to be here. And not just this back end, you know, I've worked in fraud and collections. We're always not in the head office. We're in an operations center in a slightly grimier part of town and you're sort of stark lighting and just rows and rows of cubes. It's about thinking through the same tools that are available. And if we talk about nuts and bolts from a, a lender's point of view, if they were engaging with flexes, what does that look like um, in terms of yeah, what, what, what do they see when they're engaging with you? What are you giving them to, to use with their, their customers? Yeah, so from a product perspective, you know, we have both the agent uh, platform effectively and the customer self-service in, in a single product. Um, and I think that from our you know, world, what will happen is that when a customer enters into arrears or even actually the interesting edge case is that when pre-arrears work, so when you really get the systems working together, um, when you can actually deal with things proactively, I think that's sort of where the real, the real winner is. But, um, you know, we'll automatically, from a product perspective, segment um, customers, put them into work lists. You know, we have a workflow engine that will then automatically send them comms. And the idea being that actually you're offering customers a multi-channel approach. So, you know, the answer shouldn't be you need to call us because, again, it's that it's the biggest barrier. It's the biggest hurdle. I don't want to have this conversation, let alone, you know, have to do it at a really awkward time for me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we'd offer then from a customer perspective, they would have a completely white box branded um, self-service portal so they can go in, they can make a payment, they can complete affordability assessments. And then the decisioning engine would, have, would offer the customer in real time um, the best outcome. So it might be that they do need to have a, a follow up conversation, right? Um, it might be that there's a payment holiday. There might be that there's a short term payment plan, a long term payment plan, whatever it might be. Um, but the idea is that if you can get that engagement first time and you really get the customer early, then that's where you get the best possible opportunity for resolution. And like you say, people will say to you, we're a prime lender, we have low collections rates. Okay. So what you mean by that is that when you disperse the loan, that customer fulfilled your lending criteria, right? They were prime at the time. Okay. So how long's the loan? Uh, five years okay right so in year three are they still prime oh i don't know we don't we don't need to continue to look at them because we only look at them when something happens yeah right okay so this person could be struggling subprime they could be you know taking loans from elsewhere to pay this but like you have no idea about this person's um circumstances and i think that's where we would say look actually what we do is whether it be third-party data integrations to open banking, credit reference data, or actually the, the really interesting one for us is um, core banking integrations or just core integrations. Um, so, you know, we partner now with Thought Machine, Pismo, Mambu, Saskada, Tomb. Um, and the idea being that in real time, on the day that you originate a customer, you can give that customer a footprint in your collection system, right? Because... At any point in time, those two bits of software can work together in real time. So you could have a customer who goes into arrears 
they come into collections, it actually, and you, you commented on this about the hardest sale, right? It might be that you could reoriginate the customer in collections, right? So if you do motor finance, it's really interesting to start with one of our customers, but the price of used cars went through the roof, right? So people had these assets that maybe they went into collections and they were owing money on the loan. But it turns out that the asset was worth way more than the value that it was at the time. So actually, they're going, well, hang on a minute, our collections agents should be sales guys, right? They should be going, well, hang on a minute, you could sell this and we can re-originate you and it will not only pay this off, but actually it makes it cheaper for you. And it's a really interesting thing around just thinking about stop compartmentalizing businesses into front end, back end, right? Because everyone knows all the money gets spent on the front end. Collections teams don't have money spent on them. Um, so stop doing that and just think about your customer from the day you engage them and, and, and obtaining customers is really, really hard. It's a super competitive marketplace. So why accept the fact that you get to a point where they're in difficulty and you go, well, well we've lost them. Yeah. It's not a customer we want to have, right? Because it's, it's totally untrue. When you think about how long people will be working now um, and you know the, that lifetime of things, people will make decisions and, and a very, very consumer-led finance market, people will go, I had a bad experience with X, I'm never going to use them again. And there's also, well, there's some really interesting research that TransUnion did in the US where they looked at different major crises uh, in history and they looked at the dot-com bubble burst, which actually impacted primarily super prime, prime type borrowers and something like, um, uh, I've lost the name now, but the, the big... Uh, big storms down in in the south of uh, the U.S., which impacted primarily poorer subprime customers. And what they realized is that superprime customer, when something does go wrong, they're so unfamiliar with the situation, the impact's far larger than if you've got subprime customers. They're always in a personal recession. The personal recession, they've got skills at dealing with that, and actually they can go through a crisis quite well, but your superprime customers are unfamiliar. So there's also rethinking and, and depersonalizing that aspect of default. But James, yeah, the show is called How to Lend Money to Strangers. And people always point out to me that actually, yeah, that's the easy part. It's getting the money back that's hard. So maybe it's the wrong name. But it's always been a big part of it, obviously, being able to manage your, the debts at the back end. But now, probably more than ever, we've got costs going crazy. Interest rates are rising again. The economy is sluggish at best. So we've got a lot of customers, a lot of lenders feeling the stress. What, from your view of, of the, the, the ground, what is the situation on the ground? What, what is it feeling like today in, in the sort of world of picking up debts? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult because you've had cost of living, you know, we've had COVID, you've had these sort of huge macroeconomic conditions that have made things really tough. But the thing I always struggle with is that when we have this conversation with businesses, you know, arguably in, in many ways, um, you know, our software is free to them because ultimately it's all about their ability to collect, their ability to return, and actually their ability to, you know, bring forward working capital, improve their customer's position. And the thing that always blows my mind a little bit is that what part of this doesn't make sense to a business? Because if you're a business who've lent 100 million quid, right? And you've got customers who are in financial difficulties. What point of, nothing makes sense to write that customer off, right? It, it just doesn't make sense because brand and the amount of money that businesses, you know, we sit here in Money 2020, right? And look at some of the, the great stands and a lot of the, the banks have got very fancy rooms uh, with some very fancy drinks upstairs. And you think about the amount of money that they spend on their brand, their image, the way that you want people to perceive you. And they associate all of that with the front end. They associate all of that with obtaining a customer, winning a customer. I've got a X platinum card that makes me feel something, right? So then why do you not extrapolate that all the way along the chain, right? Into the fact that, People's financial situations are not a straight line. Every single person, right? It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you earn. You know, every single person has debt of some kind and every single person at one point could be exposed to that. And I think if you're watching TV these days, every lender's 
advert will be talking about helping their customer solve a problem. Hey, we helped them get a new car, a bigger house when they had a baby. But this is the perfect chance to help someone in an hour of need and to build that brand. And yeah, more, more people than ever uh, and more tools to do it. So if anyone listening is interested in Flexus and learning more about the tools you've got, the work you're doing, seeing some of that firsthand, where can they go online to find you, to find the team, to get that sort of conversation started? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, if people are at Money 2020, they can come and find us. We're on Stand KO2. Um, they can connect with me on LinkedIn. Always happy to talk. They can go to flexus.com. Uh, as you say, we've got a, a podcast as well. Um, always happy to chat. Um, it's, uh, it's an area that I'd always be happy to talk to people about. Yeah, I was um, on the train over late last night. So about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. So I was a little bit tired and the internet was loading slow. So the images weren't up yet. I clicked through to your episode with... Um, Dan Foley, and um, hadn't finished loading, and there was episodes underneath, which I thought were other episodes of the show, um, and there was one with Yuval uh, Noah Harari, and I thought, cheap as you've got the, like, the author of uh, of Species on here, of, of Homo sapiens, of sapiens on here, and uh, I'm just talking to people in banking, and then I realized it was just shows recommended that I like yours, but a really nice show, like eight minutes, sort of snappy video uh, podcast definitely worth a look to get a really good insight of, of what some people in, in the industry are doing we'll put links to that uh, in the show notes as well as you look forward uh, obviously things are always changing is there anything on the horizon that is a trend to watch um, or anything you're bringing out for us to look out for so i think that the Age of full stack transformation, maybe cover your ears if you're Accenture or KPMG or EY, but I think a lot of businesses are moving away from the whole, we're going to transform the entire business, right? I think people are taking a challenge, taking a problem. A lot of the new core banking stacks come in to do a new product, right? And so I think people are transforming in a space. And for us, that's really where the true ecosystem of <clears throat> fintech partners comes into play. Um, because I think that being able to buy something that's pre-integrated, that's easy to adopt, um, and you can put into your organization really fast and see value, I think that's where the measure is. Um, I think there's lots of things people talk about in terms of transformational ecosystem. I would say if you're talking to a vendor, put them to the test and, and ask them to show you the integration, you know, actually show it's just working. Um, so I think that would be interesting in terms of where it goes. And I think that increasingly all of financial services, I, I think the shift will just be to consumer-led um, experience, consumer-led you know, um, decisioning. That, that's, I think, where we're going to go. Yeah, and I think that it just fits in this world of control that we've got in every aspect. And it just feels like we've got all this control, all this ability to, to self-serve from menus of products and to de- design and set up our products. But the second we miss a payment, we'll fall off. And we fall back in time 30 years. And it's a really different experience. And today is the time to sort of rethink that and to just build that debt management in. And I, I think I've been the one who's been saying collections. I know it's a lot more about managing the debt than collecting the debt and, and bringing that experience to consumers in a way that takes in. Of course, we've got regulations now that make this valuable too. But just from a human point of view, from the customers, I've always felt there's sort of a, a disconnect. We, when we build our financial models up front, you know, we're we are allowing a certain percentage of bad debt. That's what we're expecting. We're making the loans very conscious that some given percentage are going to go into default. But then when the person does default, it's sort of the blame's put on them and it becomes a sort of leaning on cultural norms and you know the, the embarrassment you're going to cause to your friends and family if they find out. And it's an unfair advantage that lenders have sometimes leveraged too heavily of course, we don't want people to take loans with no intention to pay them back, but uh, the ex- other extreme isn't right either. So great to hear from my side that this sort of stuff is happening. Lots of um, good work that can still be done in the space. So definitely, I'll put those links to the in the show notes. People can reach out to you at Flexus. But thank you, James, so much for joining me here at the, well, in the Money Pot at Money 2020. Great. Thanks, Brendan. And thank you all for listening. Please do look for and follow the show on your favorite podcast platform and share the updates widely on LinkedIn where lending nerds are found in our largest concentration. Plus, send me a connection request while you're there. Show music is by I Am Wake and you can find show notes and written transcripts at 
how to lend money to strangers dot show or just www.htlmts.show. And I'll see you again in next Thursday.